As you watch this video, the processor in your phone or laptop is converting millions of ones and zeros into 60 pictures every single second. But that's not actually the impressive part. Making that processor required a 200 ton machine, the size of a small house, using as much energy as a small town to power lasers which pulverize tiny drops of liquid metal in order to create a light so powerful that it can destroy almost anything it shines on, including air. So why do we need one of the most advanced and frankly ridiculous machines ever built to make the chips for everyday devices? In this video, in collaboration with the science and technology company Merck, I'd like to take you on a tour of how we make computer chips, and how, even though they stopped getting faster around 2005, incredible engineering, chemistry and new chip designs have nonetheless saved us from technological stagnation. But can computing power carry on increasing? With computers being increasingly important for everything from YouTube videos to secure online banking, from discovering new kinds of drugs to artificial intelligence, what does all of this mean for the future? We need to start by understanding how we got here. So first, let's find out how computer chips are made. Chips are made by a process called photolithography. And from the 1960s right up to the 1990s, it was remarkably simple. You start with a piece of silicon, and for demonstration purposes, I'm going to use this uh, piece of paper. You cover it in a chemical called photoresist. I'm going to use the ink from this highlighter pen. Then you need a template for the circuits that you want to print on the chip. So I've printed out this pattern here on a piece of transparency. Then you need a lens. I've got this magnifying glass. And finally, you need some ultraviolet or UV light. You might have seen one of these before in a club or a bar. It's that strange purplish light that makes your trainers, clothes, or gin and tonic glow. And crucially for this experiment, it also makes highlighter fluoresce, which means our fake photoresist is suddenly visible. If you've ever seen a microchip lab lit entirely in yellow light, this is why. Photoresist, like this highlighter pen, doesn't do anything under yellow light, meaning that if any stray light from the lab happens to hit it, nothing bad will happen. To make a microchip, we use the light from the UV bulb to illuminate the template. We then use this lens, like a magnifying glass, but in reverse, to take the large pattern and shrink it down onto the surface of the microchip. And where the UV hits, i.e. where the highlighter is glowing, the photoresist is exposed. Being exposed doesn't just make it glow. It causes a chemical reaction to take place, meaning that when you wash the chip with another chemical, you can wash the exposed photoresist away, and then you can do various chemical stuff. Can you tell, despite the white coat, I'm not actually a chemist. And that affects the exposed parts of the silicon to make tiny electronic components. But where the photoresist wasn't exposed, in the shadows, it isn't washed away, and the silicon is protected, so it remains pure. Chip manufacturers do this repeatedly to build up many layers of complex circuitry on a modern microchip. Amazingly, even though every other part of my chip manufacturing facility is <laughs> a bit of a simplification, the one part that's pretty much accurate is this UV bulb. It's called a mercury vapour lamp, and it's very similar to a fluorescent bulb, like this one. Inside both, electricity is passed through a very thin atmosphere of mercury, and the mercury makes both UV and visible light. The difference between the bulbs is the coating inside each of them. The coating inside the fluorescent bulb turns UV into visible light. In fact, if I turn on the UV lamp, you can see it starts to glow blue, because it makes blue visible light specifically. This both makes it brighter and stops you from getting sunburn indoors. Whereas this UV bulb does essentially the opposite. It's got a coating that blocks the visible light and only allows UV to escape. And UV from mercury vapour bulbs, only slightly more advanced than this one, was all that we needed for decades even for cutting-edge microchip manufacture. My family got our first computer in 1993, a 486 with 66 megahertz of CPU power. Amazingly, the lithography for this processor was done with a mercury vapor bulb, but I'm not sure this excited me that much at the time, and I was more interested in QBasic, Minesweeper, and Microsoft Paint. In 2001, I got a computer of my own, an AMD Athlon 1200, which clocked in at an incredible 1,200 megahertz, or 1.2 gigahertz. So, in less than a decade, the computer on my desk had got 18 times faster. What an exciting time to be a nerd. And check out those fluorescent hedgehog stickers, a sure indication of computing excellence. 
So let's plot my computers on a graph. Notice, by the way, that this graph has what's called a log scale, meaning that if you move a certain distance up it, that corresponds to a doubling of speed. So 1993, 66 MHz, 2001, 1.2 gigahertz, which translates to roughly a doubling of speed every two years. My subsequent computers had a 2.2 gigahertz processor in 2006, 3.4 gigahertz in 2012, and 3.8 gigahertz in 2020. So you can see that trend of speed doubling every two years ran out of steam pretty quickly. Unfortunately, it wasn't just me. If we plot the general trend in CPU speed since 1970, you can see that I got into computers at the tail end of a long trend of computer speed massively increasing. And since the late 2000s, progress has stagnated. You've probably heard of Moore's Law, the famous prediction from scientist Gordon Moore that computer power doubles every two years or so. But it's really widely misunderstood. What exactly do we mean by computing power? Well, some people talk about computer speed, but if it's that, as we've already seen, Moore's Law is dead, and has been for almost two decades. But what Moore actually said was nerdier and more interesting. He noticed that the number of tiny components called transistors that you could squeeze onto a chip was doubling every two years. If we replot my almost three decades of computers in terms of transistor count rather than raw speed, you can see that that increase has been continual. And again, it's not just me. If we add more data, you can see that this trend has been incredibly, almost bizarrely consistent since the late 1960s. And the log scale hides just how incredible the numbers are on here. We've gone from a few thousand transistors on a chip in 1970 to over 100 billion on the top chips today. To keep fitting twice as many transistors on a chip every two years, you have to keep making those transistors smaller. But by the 1990s, there was trouble on the horizon. Transistors were getting smaller than the 365 nanometer light produced by a classic UV bulb. So unless we found a way to make UV with a shorter wavelength, the second half of this graph would never have happened. So microchip manufacturers ditched mercury vapor bulbs and started using UV lasers to make ultraviolet light with shorter wavelengths. Not to dismiss the amazing work of scientists and engineers, allowing Moore's ridiculous rate of miniaturization to continue, but the tech here was basically the same as before, just using a laser rather than a light bulb. However, if we wanted to keep Moore's law going, it was obvious that we'd eventually outgrow even the most powerful 192 nanometer UV lasers. So engineers decided to go all out and create extreme ultraviolet light, or EUV. And that's when things started to get slightly out of hand. I find it fascinating that certain types of light are really easy to produce. You can make visible light and infrared with fire, which humans have obviously been doing for thousands of years. And it's also possible with a whole range of types of light bulb. Visible light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, stretching from radio, which we've been making for about a century, to x-rays, which we've been making for about a hundred years too. But certain kinds of light are just bizarrely difficult to make. An extreme UV is one of them. Let me tell you just how difficult. First, you get a box about the size of a house. Then, in the basement, you position an enormous CO2 laser. This is where the action starts. And amazingly, it starts with laser light with a wavelength of about 10 microns, or 10,000 nanometers. Almost a thousand times larger than what we're going to end this labyrinthine process with. This laser flashes 100,000 times per second, with pulses in pairs. Why pairs? We'll get to that. The next critical ingredient is microscopic droplets of liquid metal. What's basically a tin machine gun fires 50,000 drops of liquid tin every second at 300 kilometers per hour, roughly 200 miles an hour. Each of those droplets is precisely timed to line up with those pairs of laser pulses. The first pulse is a gentle knock that takes the spherical droplet of tin and causes it to splash outwards turning it into the optimal target for the second, this time incredibly powerful laser pulse, which blasts the tin with so much energy that it turns from a liquid to plasma, hotter and denser than a bolt of lightning. It's this tin plasma that then emits a huge pulse of extreme UV, which is reflected by this parabolic mirror and sent on its way into the rest of the machine. The next challenge is controlling that EUV light. It has so much energy that glass lenses, or even just air, will absorb it. That means everything needs to take place in a near-perfect vacuum. 
and then we use special multi-coated mirrors made of 50 nanometer scale alternating layers of molybdenum and silicon, made with such precision that if they were scaled up to the size of the earth, then the biggest mountain on them would be about as tall as the thickness of a human hair. And even these incredible feats of shininess only reflect about 70% of the EUV that falls on them. It takes 10 mirrors to guide and focus the EUV onto the microchips you're making, which means the losses rapidly multiply. 70% times 70% 10 times means less than 3% of the light you start with makes it through the system, meaning that more than 97% does nothing else except warm up those mirrors. The final amount of power delivered to expose the photoresist on the chips is, drumroll please, less than 10 watts. To describe this machine as inefficient would be an understatement. All of this kit requires about a megawatt of power, in the same ballpark as a thousand households' electricity usage, to produce about as much light as a single LED light bulb. I did say, making extreme UV is extremely hard. However, what sounds like staggering inefficiency is worth it. The 13.5 nanometer extreme ultraviolet light these machines produce has allowed manufacturers to continue shrinking transistors on microchips and basically kept Moore's law alive. But obviously, even this can't go on forever. We're already close to the limits of this generation of EUV technology. So what can we do next? Well, for a start, we can't make computer chips faster. The reason we've been stuck with computers running at 3 to 5 gigahertz since 2005 is the laws of physics. For decades, halving the size of transistors also allowed us to double their operating speed. But then, in the 2000s, several different things went wrong that brought this trend to an end. By then, the transistors on chips were so small that they were losing energy due to bizarre quantum effects. One was that a critical component called the dielectric was just a few atoms across, which means that the electric current could do something called quantum tunneling. If you imagine the transistor as a tiny switch, that means that the power could jump across even when the switch was turned off. And this meant that driving the transistors to work more quickly would have generated a huge amount of heat, and we've been stuck with 4-ish gigahertz ever since. The good news is we've managed to wring a lot of benefits out of having more transistors on chips, even if individually they're not operating any more quickly. You might have noticed that computers these days usually have more than one core, which means essentially you've got multiple separate processors that can operate in parallel on different tasks. Even phones have multi-core processors these days. The iPhone 14 has a six-core processor, and Samsung's S23 has eight. The problem is, given that our solution is to cram more and more stuff onto chips, we still need to find a way to keep making that stuff smaller. And exactly how that's going to happen is still uncertain. Chip manufacturers are looking into using even shorter wavelengths of extreme UV, or using X-rays, which have even shorter wavelengths still, to make ever more intricate circuits on chips. Another idea is to use clever chemistry to make patterns smaller than current lithography can manage, or exploring new materials like gallium arsenide, which could be more efficient than silicon. But all of these have the fundamental problem that components on chips are just a few atoms across, which puts a hard limit on how much smaller we can go. One thing we're trying is to build transistors in the third dimension. Current chips are flat, 2D, the equivalent of a city made entirely of one-storey buildings, and so building silicon skyscrapers would allow us to fit far more components on a chip with the same physical footprint, allowing Moore's law of doubling transistor count per chip to continue. Unfortunately, this isn't one of those videos with a simple, satisfying solution at the end. Many commentators are again predicting the end of Moore's law, but we heard that in 2005, and as we've seen, even though processors did stop getting faster, some incredible, ingenious science and engineering has allowed us to work around that. What happens next is uncertain. Could something like quantum computing come out of left field and totally change how certain kinds of calculations are done? Will artificial intelligence be designing computer chips to run ever more advanced computer chip designing artificial intelligences on? I don't think anyone really knows. But whatever happens, I'm sure the machines we use to make computer chips are only going to get more ridiculous. And you know what? <laughs> I can't wait. Many thanks to the science and technology company Merck for sponsoring this video. Did you know that they're involved in cutting-edge microchip manufacturing? As well as supplying various bits and pieces for EUV lithography, they're also working hard to get a smart process called directed self-assembly working. 
This is something that could allow us to make smaller patterns than EUV alone, by using molecules that self-assemble into repeating structures. This works because different parts of these molecules are attracted or repelled by one another, and as they wiggle around, they eventually find their way into a structure where all the parts that want to be next to one another are indeed next to each other, and all the ones that don't are far apart. This idea draws its inspiration from biology, where structures as simple as cell membranes or as complex as the extracellular matrix that binds our bodies together self-assemble from smaller molecular components, guided only by the forces between molecules. The idea is that you could create a guide pattern with conventional UV photolithography and then sprinkle a bunch of these self-assembling molecules over it. The lithographic pattern would act as a guide to position the potentially far smaller pattern of self-assembling molecules. And lots of structures on the surface of microchips are large areas of repeating patterns, so this tech has the potential to be a really big deal. So fingers crossed and really good luck to Merck's scientists trying to get it working. You can find out more about directed self-assembly and loads more cool stuff at the links in the description.